Sussex Daylight Time, it is now 7 o'clock. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Thank you all for coming. Thank the Village of Sussex for letting us use the boardroom and for local law enforcement for helping us out at the, the meeting tonight. For those of you whom I haven't met, I'm Jim Sensenbrenner, your Congressman. Seated up here with me are State Representative Janelle Branchen and Adam Naylor. Sussex is divided between two assembly districts. So the representatives from both of those districts are here tonight to answer your questions and hear your comments about what's going on in Madison while I try to do the same on the federal issues. I appreciate the opportunity to hear your concerns. In fact, in 2017, I had 115 public meetings. You may have heard that some of these meetings have been contentious. I had one of those yesterday afternoon in Jefferson. So I want to be sure to review the rules that we all need to adhere to so that we can have an orderly environment in which to exchange ideas. First of all, I ask that all of you sign in with my staff. If you would like an opportunity to speak, you need to check the speaking box that appears on the sign-in slips. That way I'll know to call on you during the first part of the meeting. I will be giving to those of you who reside in the Sussex-Lisbon area then, if time permits, I will continue to call on residents of the 5th District, and if additional time permits, I will call on those who don't reside in the 5th District. This portion of the meeting will last about an hour and 20 minutes. I expect participants to be respectful and to allow the person who is recognized and has the floor the opportunity to speak without interruption, as well as when I respond to each comment. Further, if the question you would like to ask or the comment you would like to make has already been made, please refrain from asking it again. We should try to hear from as many of you and on as many issues as we can within the time restraints. If at any time participants become rude or disruptive, I will immediately adjourn the meeting as there's nothing positive to be gained from continuing with a meeting that is disorderly. We can all disagree without becoming disagreeable. Signs are okay in this room as long as they are neither disruptive nor obstructive. The second portion of the meeting is devoted to those of you who seek my help with personal problems they're experiencing with the federal government. And if you have a problem with the state agency, either of the two state representatives will take down the information. This part of the meeting is an opportunity for us to have a one-on-one -on -one private conversation and is not the time to continue discussions from the general part of the meeting. Any filming or recording is prohibited during this portion of the meeting and the reason for that is that a lot of the people who approach me are veterans who have problems with VA medical and there's no reason at all why this type of private information uh, should get up on social media. You know, this is uh, for the protection of the people who want to tell me what their problem is, uh, uh, you know, over everything. And I ask all of you to respect that kind of a person or a person who is that kind of a, uh, uh, has that kind of a problem's privacy. So with any further ado, the first up in this part of the meeting is Randy McDonald of Donna is it Road or Street in Sussex. Now. Yes, well, well, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, you um, you know, I, I got several issue questions, you know, and I'm not sure I can point to all the um, I think I'll do one is it's corporate taxes, you know. I mean, it's great that we use corporate taxes to make our industry more competitive. Well, um, one thing about the tax code that I did not like is that we, we gave it away to everyone, no matter what. And then kind of going with the uh, you know, not that much Trump took order, but bring American first, I think everyone everyone is for that, no matter what you support um, Mr. Trump or not. But my question is, you know, why did we put more things like you get a tax break, but we don't give you an even percentage, you get you get a certain break for hiring every American worker you hire, you get a tax break. Every American worker you buy provide health care for, you get a tax break. You know, and this goes with trying to say, hey, corporations that do not hire American workers or do not provide health care, which are for the greater good of the United States, don't get the tax rate. We don't give it away for free, but yet you can still get down to the lower tax rate by being a responsible 
well, citizen or corporation? Well, you kind of got a two-part question. Let me answer your second part first. Uh, the reason we were not able to do things like that was money. Uh, originally, uh, when we were talking about tax reform, we were expecting to get a trillion dollars over a 10-year period from the repeal and replacement of Obamacare. That did not pass the Senate, so that trillion dollars ended up being off the table. And then there was a proposal in the original plan to uh, have a border adjustment tax where we would be taxing imports rather than taxing exports. And that got practically no support in the Congress except from you know, a few people on the Ways and Means Committee. That was $600 billion over 10 years. If we had that trillion, $600 billion, we would have been able to get to those kinds of, uh, those kinds of things. And, you know, that ended up, you know, being a casualty of uh, these two issues that didn't happen. Okay. Let me ask you, answer your first question. Well, I guess Let me answer your first question, please, okay. sir. Uh, uh, you know, as far as the corporate tax break is concerned, there has been a lot of opposition from our friends on the political left. We had the highest corporate tax rate in any industrialized country in the world. And we were losing headquarters of companies like Johnson Controls that went overseas to countries that had lower corporate tax rates. Ours was 35 percent. The headquarters of Johnson Controls is now in Ireland, which has a 12 and a half percent corporate tax rate. And we also had a 35 percent repatriation tax so that American-based companies that repatriated their money that was earned abroad got nailed with 35%. So they did not repatriate uh, those taxes. Now, what happened? You know, Apple saw that there was a two-year low repatriation tax. They're bringing back $360 billion of money that they've earned on their overseas activities, which is about 20,000 high-tech and relatively high-paid jobs in America, and they also will pay about $38 billion in corporate income taxes that never would have been assessed and paid if the tax bill hadn't passed and they kept that money overseas. We've seen a whole list of companies that have ended up giving bonuses and up, uh, adding money to employees 401k retirement plans, uh, ended up uh, making major charitable contributions to charities that operate in the area in which their employees work. That never would have happened without the tax rate reduction as well. So I think that, you know, this was a win-win-win type situation. There also has been some criticism that the individual tax rates expire in 2025. And I don't like that either. And one of the things that we ought to do, I think, uh, by the end of the year, uh, is take away that expiration date of the individual tax breaks. The reason we have to do that is because of some arcane rules that the United States Senate has, you know, in order to bring the bill up and pass it. Now that it's up and passed, we ought to complete the job by repealing that expiration date. Your follow-up question, sir? Well, yeah, I guess some of my questions are not that we can give the tax cut, but we made some requirements of that tax cut and we went and said, you know, a 10% tax cut. We gave, well, you know, on we, gave, your... we gave a 5% and then the rest of it would be instead of the higher American workers mm -hmm. to get the tax cut. Again, if we had had the billion six yeah. additional, you would have seen things like that. In there. That was a casualty you know, to the failure of the Senate to repeal and replace uh, uh, Obamacare and the fact that uh, this border adjustment or import tax uh, ended up being extremely unpopular and had to be dropped. Uh, Laura Watson, Sun Valley, run Sussex. Hello, Representative. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Um, um, you know, after the Parkland uh, shooting, um, I'm uh, very interested in firearms uh, legislation, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are, and if you would be willing to support legislation like gun violence, restraining order, or flag laws, or extreme risk protection. protection well, you know, you know, first of all, let me say that the Parkland, Florida shooting was a preventable tragedy. 
law enforcement dropped the ball. You know, there was somebody who called up the FBI and said, you know, uh, this guy had put up on the internet that he wanted to be a professional school shooter. What more do you need on that? They didn't follow it up. There were several calls from people who lived near with him, him that said that this kid was a bad actor. And the local police and the local sheriff's department didn't follow up on that. On Tuesday, uh, my subcommittee on crime is scheduled to have a hearing to look into that and to see what needs to be done so the ball doesn't get dropped again and another tragedy results. Now, you know, in terms of what we can do, first of all, in 1993, I was the author of the instant check system. Uh, and I got that into the Brady Bill after a lot of pushing and shoving because uh, they did not see the value of the instant check system. Under laws that we've had on the books for decades, uh, anybody who has a felony conviction or a mental incompetency adjudication cannot even possess any kind of firearm. And that law was amended that anybody who has a restraining order against them in a domestic violence situation uh, uh, can't possess any kind of a firearm either. You know, a lot of you know the problems with a lot of that you know, is enforcement, which Congress doesn't do. We just make laws, we don't enforce them. But since, <coughs> since Nix was up and running, which was in the late 90s, there have been 4.7 million illegal firearms transactions that Nix stopped. And I can't tell you how many uh, mass shootings were stopped as a result of that, because nobody will ever know that. But it has been effective. Now, NICS is only as good as the data that's put into it. And the House has passed, and the Senate is currently considering a bill that's called Fix NICS, uh, which would end up uh, 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 forcing certain agencies of government that have not put data into the NICS system that belongs there, such as the military, uh, to do that as well. So if somebody ended up being disciplined by being a part of the military, for some kind of violence or threatening to shoot somebody, then that information can get put into mix, and they would have a ban on that as well. Now, you know, I am in favor of something that uh, Senator Rubio has proposed, where uh, it basically would be a way to deal with people who have got mental issues, like Nicholas Cruz had, but did not, you know, did not get hauled into court because the way the current law stands is that you have to be a danger to yourself or a danger to others, you know, in order to get put into mix and also in order to be forced to get some kind of treatment for your problems. And if you look at the danger to others part of this requirement that the Supreme Court has put on us, you really have to be, do something, have an overt act that is a danger to others, and you know, then it really is too late, because Nicholas Cruz did not do any overt act until he got into Parkland High School. We also need uh, to have some money to help school districts harden their entrances uh, on that. And while I am not in favor of arming teachers, I am in favor of having law enforcement or retired law enforcement that have the appropriate training stationed in school when school is open for business on that. So, and that person, you know, ought to be stationed near the door. And the bill that the House passed last week in hardening it, you know, would kind of have a buzz-in system. So after all the kids go to school, the door gets locked. You have to buzz in, state who you are, state what you want to do there. And if you don't have a legitimate reason and probably an appointment, uh, ahead of time, you're not going to get let in. Uh, and that, I think, would, would also be helpful. So, you know, all of this, you know, ends up, you know, weaving together. Some of it would require new legislation. Some of it would require law enforcement to be more sensitive, which obviously the Florida law enforcement was not. Some of it, you know, requires what I would refer to as capital expenditures so that uh, nobody can walk into, into any school in the country and start firing away. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that I think needs to be done. But let me say I'm proud of having the NICS system, you know, being the father of the NICS system on that. 
because it has been effective 4.7 million times in stopping firearms transactions that people who cannot legally possess a firearm today. Can I have a follow-up question? Sure. So I saw... Can, you, can everybody in the back of the room hear what she's saying? No. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so as a follow-up, um, with the gun restraining, or gun violence restraining order, I'm um, particularly interested in um, an emergency clause which would allow uh, families that are in a crisis situation or in a very volatile situation to have local law enforcement be able to take weapons out of the home uh, for a certain amount of time, whatever, 21 days, so that their yeah. family member is able to get the mental and emotional health care that they yeah. need and to resolve the issue. Yeah. Um, would you be uh, supportive of a clause like that which would speed up the process for volatile situations? The problem with that is that I am certain that it would be held unconstitutional as a violation of due process. And allowing law enforcement or family members to follow the Rubio red flag plan, you put the due process first. So you know you go into court, uh, you know the court will hold a hearing, and the court can issue a temporary restraining order, you know that ends up being sent into the fixed mix system. And if there's a temporary restraining order, you know, for somebody who does possess firearms, you know, that restraining order can re require those firearms to be surrendered to law enforcement for the duration of the restraining order. You may recall it a few years ago, you know, there was somebody who shot up uh, the spa across from Brookfield Square. And, uh, you know, that was a domestic violence situation. The person who worked in the spa went and got a restraining order, but never gave it to the police to enforce. Uh, that tragedy would not have happened had she got given the restraining order that a judge entered, you know, following a due process hearing uh, to the Brown Deer police to enforce. So again, you know, uh, you know, you can get pieces of paper, either bills passed by Congress or the state legislature, or restraining orders signed by judges. You know, and unless they're given to law enforcement to enforce, all they are is a piece of paper, and it doesn't stop somebody who has been adjudicated following a hearing uh, to be a danger to others uh, from being prevented to actually endangering others by their actions. Uh, Alexis Kupka, that make Lavin in Sussex? Yep. Uh, so mine's a two-part. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you for introducing HR 750, uh, which protects, puts a wheelchair CRT complex rehab technology um, into a separate billing category. Yeah. Um, if you you guys may not be aware, since the brother is a big advocate for those in wheelchairs, um, but I'm also asking for your support. Like my wife. Yes. Um, so I'm also asking for support of HR 3730. Uh, which gives the same protection of wheelchair accessories for manual chairs as they are for power chairs. Mm -hmm. You know, what, you know, one of one of the problems in, in building building power chairs to uh, uh, Medicare, you know, is that Medicare doesn't like power chairs. Mm -hmm. They're expensive. It costs Medicare more money. But it, you know, it is an accessibility aid to people who you know have a condition where they can use a power chair. And one of the things my wife and I have done, you know, during a lifetime of both of us advocating for uh, people with disabilities, you know, is to try to get them off benefits and to get them into the workforce, which is, you know, good for their psyche, uh, you know, as well as uh, good for the taxpayer because instead of paying money out, they're earning money and they're paying taxes on the money uh, that they earn. I don't have a problem with the other bill you know, on manual chairs uh, uh, on that. And with the power chairs, you know, we have to pass temporary authorities uh, because uh, whoever has been in charge of the H&HS department in Medicare, you know, count the beans rather than uh, the good that it can do to people with disabilities. Uh, one of these days we will get this sprung loose and make it permanent. Yes, hopefully. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, David Linsky of Kaniski Street in Sussex. Thank you, Karen. Um, my question is uh, about 
my concern about campaign finance reform laws and the undue influence on politicians. As after the uh, Citizens United ruling by the Supreme Court, it seems like we the people don't have a voice anymore. Not true. You're here tonight, so am I. But I'd like to quote someone that uh, from their 2010 State of the Union address said that with all due deference to uh, separation of powers, last week the Supreme Court reversed a century of law and I believe will open the floodgates for special interests, including foreign corporations, to spend without limit in our elections. I don't think American elections should be bankrolled by America's most powerful interests, or worse, by foreign entities. They should be decided by the American people, and I'd urge Democrats and Republicans to pass a bill that helps to correct some of these problems. He also said a major victory for big oil, Wall Street banks, health insurance companies, and other powerful interests that marshal their powers every day in Washington to drown out the voices of the American people. And I'd like to know if uh, you would consider something similar to what McCain and Feingold did. No, I mean, their bill uh, is a good cause of the problem, you know. Uh, right, but it's time that it needs to be changed. Well, you know, the Supreme, the, Supreme, the Supreme Court, Mr. Linsky, has been very, very insistent that only candidates can be regulated because we give up some of our rights when we voluntarily stick our names on a ballot in the election. But nobody else can because that would violate the First Amendment, uh, both the right of free speech and the right of free political expression, which the Supreme Court has repeatedly, time and time and time again, you know, has said that is something that uh, cannot be infringed upon. And if you read the First Amendment, it begins, Congress shall pass no law. And there are a whole lot of things after that that Congress shall pass no law. Uh, I don't think that we should amend the Bill of Rights for the first time in history, which is what the people who advocate overturning the Citizens United decision uh, you know, are, are doing. The bill I think it's ridiculous. May, may, may I right. respond to you? You don't have to agree with me, and I know you don't, but I'm explaining the position that I've taken to everybody who is in this room. And, you know, the Bill of Rights has made America different than any other country in the world because it protects the people from government tyranny and government infringement. Now, let me talk about McCain Feingold, which, in my opinion, has caused a lot of the problem on that. Prior to McCain-Feingold's enactment in 2002, labor unions and corporations could make direct contributions to political parties, not for candidate advocacy, such as vote for Janelle or vote against Jim, but for party building activities like voter registrations, rights at the polls, absentee ballots, surveys, and things like that. Now, Matt, and that's something that I think we expect our political parties to do. McCain Feingold made that illegal. So that money has not been available to political parties. Now, what the corporations and the labor, the labor unions have done is they have set up these independent, corpora independent uh, advocacy organizations, which flood the TV before any election with negative ads. You know, these folks don't have anything positive to say about anybody. And that, more than anything else, has polarized American society and American political discourse uh, on it. And it has been bad for this country, you know, in my opinion. And if you look at the last presidential election, about 85% of the money was spent not by the Clinton campaign or the Trump campaign, uh, but by the independent advocacy organizations, which are a direct result, you know, of McCain-Feingold. Um, and, you know, it, it's McCain-Feingold that should be repealed rather than Citizens United. Now, you know, if I had my brothers, you know, I would like to see all money go through the Sensenbrenner Committee to advocate my election. Because that way I'm responsible for what's said on my behalf. You know, and conversely, you know, what is said against my opponent. With these independent expenditures, they are prohibited from coordinating whatsoever, you know, with the candidates that they are trying to help out. So, 
you know, if there's something nasty, you know, that comes up, the candidate that is supposed to be helped uh, uh, on that can say, well, I didn't have anything to do with that because the law prohibits me from coordinating. Uh, with that, so they are able to escape responsibility. So, you know, I think the way, you know, you get around that is you get rid of all these limits on candidates, but instead what you do is you require every contribution by source and amount to be put up on the internet before the money hits the candidate's bank account uh, on that. That way everybody has access to this information before the election rather than waiting for some post-election financial report to be filed and somebody who has uh, gone over the line, you know, laughs their way off to public office for whatever the term of the office that they uh, were elected to. You know, I know that this is something that, you know, is very controversial, but this way we don't amend the First Amendment. You know, we get rid of, you know, what, you know, what happened since the Buckley case of 1976 and every time Congress has passed a campaign finance law since that decision, the cure has been worse than the disease, you know, without, with, without exception. So, you know, there's a way to get out of this while upholding the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights and the rest of the Constitution. Uh, but it's going to have to take several steps backwards and using new technology because the Internet was not around in 1976. Uh, you know, to, to give people more information. Now, the final point I'd like to make it is that it's always been illegal, and it is under all campaign finance uh, uh, decisions by the Supreme Court of the United States for any foreign entity to contribute to any candidate for federal office or any campaign committee that advocates in favor of a candidate for federal office. You know, so. Foreign contributions, whether they're individual contributions, you know, or uh, 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 corporate contributions from outside the United States, have always been illegal and will continue to be so. Yeah, I'd just like to add that uh, McCain and Feingold, their intentions were good. It was changed by the Supreme Court where they. No, it wasn't. How, how did they give corporations the first. Because a corporation under U.S. law that's been there for over 150 years has been treated as a person. That's how they did that. And they didn't change the law on how corporations were treated. Because a corporation can go into court just like an individual can go into court. And that's a constitutional right that both corporations and individuals have if they want the court to make a determination, you know, where they have a grievance with somebody else. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that's the, the reasoning uh, that the Supreme Court used on, on this. You know, I can say that, you know, the effect of McCain-Feingold was to transfer the money that went to parties not for candidate activities but for party building activities to these independent organizations, and that was a huge step backward uh, on that. But if you want to fix it, I don't think we ought to amend the Constitution. You know, there have only been 28 amendments uh, that have been passed since uh, 1789, and the first 10 were the Bill of Rights, and you know, the other 18 were on other subjects since 1791. So it is very, very hard to amend the Constitution. You know, and that's the framers had that in mind. So you know, that their handiwork, which I thought was brilliant, you know, ended up surviving and has served this country, you know, very, very well. Now, you know, some of the things that the Supreme Court in mccain Feingold declared as unconstitutional is Feingold put in a provision in that law that said that if you wanted to spend $10 of your own money printing up leaflets saying that people shouldn't vote for me and put that around or distributed that around the neighborhood, you will have committed a federal misdemeanor and you could be subject to a $500 fine and a $600 jail term or a six hundred month or six month jail term, you know, or both. And you know, that's outrageous, you know, in my opinion. Uh, but, you know, it's the fact that, you know, what Feingold wanted to do on that, and he still is defending it, you know, is saying that, you know, if you don't like somebody, we'll shut you up for the 90 days before the election. And that's you know, that's just flat out dead wrong. Uh, well, I just think they should, Congress should amend the Constitution to 
take it away from corporations. Free, free, free well, amendment. you know, how, how, do you, how do you do that? Because a corporation is a... I don't know, you're the, you're the, you're the kind well, of... Well, you can't do that. You know, I'm saying a corporation has just as much right to go to court as an individual does. And that has been settled law in, the, court, in court, the United yes. States. You know, now, quad graphics down the road, if you take, you know, the right to go to court, uh, you know, away from corporations, if they've got a complaint with, you know, with anybody, you know, they can't go to court. And they ought to have the ability to go to court, and they have a constitutional right to go to court, just like individuals do. Yeah, go to court. All right. Yeah, all right. But, you know, if, if you take it away from corporations, then the corporations don't have any standing. You know, and the thing gets bounced out, you know, a court right, a court right away because the plaintiff has no standing. Uh, Paul Forshager of uh, Windy Pass in Sussex. Yeah, I'll be very brief. I just uh, would like to know when you and your Republican friends are going to develop backbone and do stuff about Trump. Comrade Trump. Moron, and this country is going to end up like Venezuela. Well, that's it. Mr. Trump was elected. I know he was elected. Uh, I guess yeah. you didn't vote for him either. Am I right on that? <laughs> you know, but the fact of the matter that he was, you know, he was elected. Uh, you know, uh, people on the losing side were not very happy. Uh, that happened to us in the previous eight years. And you know, my feeling you know, is, is that, you know, rather than uh, name calling, uh, you ought to, you know, work with the president where you agree with him, hopefully. Yeah, give me his phone number, he might call me back, huh? Okay, yeah. well, that's, you know, that's, that's up to him on, you know, whether to call you back, but uh, uh, if you say what you just told me, if he does call you back, I think you'll hang up and then send a tweet out about it. <laughs> uh, Matthew Lehner of Linda Drive in Sussex. Uh, thank you, Mr. Senator Brenner, for coming to Sussex today. Leadership has always been a key aspect of my life, um, and this year um, I've worked hard to be elected as the Hamilton Sussex Class of 2021 President and Senior Patrol Leader of my Boy Scout Troop in Menominee Falls. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And it is my duty to listen to other people and to address their concerns and ideas appropriately. Um, in light of the school shooting in Stoneman Douglas um, High School in Parkland, Florida, members of my class and people in my troop have expressed their um, remorse and concern and concern about their safety at school. And that they wonder um, that the elected leaders um, will do something to prevent this from happening in the future. So, as a gun owner and a sportsman myself, my question is, will you risk an A rating and future campaign contributions from the NRA and vote to pass legislation banning the AR-15 and similar assault-style weapons, with, this we with these weapons' only purpose being to quickly kill mass quantities of people, period? Well, the answer is no, I don't know that, and here's why. Uh, the AR-15 is a semi-automatic weapon. Automatic weapons have been banned for decades, except with a very, very hard to get permit. So you can't go in and get an automatic weapon. I am for banning bump stocks. You know, bump stocks turn a legal semi-automatic weapon into an illegal automatic weapon, you know, extremely easily. And that was what was used in the shooting uh, at the Country and Western uh, concert in Las Vegas a few months ago. Uh, Semi-automatic weapons are legal in, for hunting in most states of the Union, including Wisconsin. Uh, uh, a weapon can be used for an illegal and a criminal purpose, true. But the fact is, is that there are many hunters in this state that use semi-automatic weapons that are similar to AR-15s or AR-15s and the Wisconsin DNR in setting up our fish and game regulations, uh, you know, have said that this is a sporting weapon that can be used for sporting purposes, you know, assuming you get a hunting license, uh, you know, assuming uh, you are hunting during the, the open game season. And I don't think it is fair that because one person who is mentally deranged ends up using one of these types of weapons to shoot up a school, uh, there's a reason to ban these weapons 
for thousands or maybe even millions of people who use these types of firearms for illegal hunting purposes. You know, I grant you that, you know, a bad apple can spoil the whole barrel, but I think in response to the earlier question relative to school safety, you know, I have outlined things that will be effective and things that Congress is doing. Providing money to harden schools, uh, to provide money uh, to have either law enforcement or retired law enforcement uh, in schools. Having a red flag provision to Senator Rubio uh, has suggested, which the NRA is not for, but which I am for, uh, so that somebody who is exhibiting mental issues, you know, can, uh, you go into court, you have the due process, and you can get a restraining order, just like you can get a restraining order in a person who is committing domestic violence, you know, at home. But, you know, all we can do is legislate. We do not do the enforcement. Uh, I, will repeat that on Tuesday I'm scheduled to have a hearing on what happened where all of the warning signs about Nicholas Cruz ended up being, the ball ended up being dropped, you know, both by the FBI and by local law enforcement. People have got to be sensitive to that when tips are uh, called on in. And from what I have heard, everybody in town knew that Nicholas Cruz was a bad person. You know, and he admitted on social media that he wanted to be a professional school shooter and nothing was done about him. And this was a preventable tragedy. And it was a preventable tragedy not because the law was deficient, but because the execution of the law uh, uh, ended up being deficient. And you'll probably hear more about that on the news on Tuesday night if we end up having the hearing. There was a congresswoman that died uh, uh, on Friday and uh, if the funeral is on Tuesday, uh, uh, everything is going to get postponed so that we can go to the funeral uh, on that. But we'll reschedule a hearing if we have to reschedule a hearing. Uh, you know, what I can say is every time there's a tragedy that occurs, you know, the pressure is on Congress to pass something that will prevent the tragedy from happening again. Ten years ago, Congress passed. I supported it. The NRA did not. President George W. Bush signed a law that made it a, crime, a federal crime to carry a firearm within a thousand feet of any school in the country. That sure didn't work down in Parkland, didn't it? But Nicholas Cruz violated the law. And everybody thought that because we passed this law, we'd solve the problem because there were no, nobody could legally have a firearm, you know, within a thousand feet of any school. So, you know, I'm, listen, I'm interested in doing things that are effective in this, you know, rather than bowing before the TV cameras. And that's the kind of congressman that I have been, you know, ever since I was first elected. I was effective in getting NICS in, the, the Brady Bill, over the NRA's objectives. Uh, I supported the Lautenberg Amendment that allows uh, NICS to ban firearm sales to people who have had restraining orders against them where they have threatened violence in their houses. You know, that has been effective. And, you know, when you have a restraining order against you, you can't possess any kind of firearm. We either got to turn them in voluntarily or involuntarily. Those are the kinds of things that I am interested in. But to say that banning semi-automatic weapons, when most of them, the overwhelming amount of them, are used for legal hunting purposes because state DNRs have said that they're, you know, a sporting type firearm because one nutcase, you know, who fell through the cracks, you know, ended up shooting up the school, ends up discriminating against people who use firearms for legal purposes. And I think, pun intended, well, we've got to use a rifle shot to go after the people who either have a criminal record, which means they've usually used the firearm in the commission of a crime, uh, or who have got mental problems. We've got a loophole in the law on that, and you know I support plugging that loophole with the red flag provision. But the, you know, Mr. Sensenbrenner, these laws we can we can go on and on forever and ever, creating all these small little laws that do that only do so much. We there is always going to be loopholes through those small little laws, no matter what you do to try to stop it. What we need to do is we, as American people, need to, you know, look at you guys when stuff happens. 
you guys in Congress should be responsible for something like that well, that happens during a tragedy. You know, the, the answer to that is, you know, I'm only responsible for me. I'm not responsible for anybody else in the world. Um, you know, I think I have a record, you know, that goes after effective means of dealing with this problem. Uh, and I am looking for effective means in dealing with the, uh, for problems like this from arising in the future. Again, Parkland was a preventable tragedy. It's unfortunate that the ball ended up being dropped and Nicholas Cruz ended up falling through the cracks. We need to deal with mental health problems. The hole is not in the firearms law. The hole is in the mental health law where you actually have to commit a crime and be a danger to others before anybody can do anything about it. You know, whether it's to get a restraining order, whether it's to force you into some kind of treatment for you know, mental health. And there are a lot of people where they see somebody who is the, has the potential of violence who won't come up and say anything, you know, about it. And, you know, we've had the see something, say something thing, you know, as far as terrorist activity, which has been, I think, reasonably effective. We've got to do that for people who have got mental health problems, you know, on that to get the treatment that they need before they go and harm and kill a whole lot of other people. So we're not talking about AR-15, you know, that's a piece of machinery which does what the finger on the trigger tells it to do. Uh, and if the finger on the trigger, you know, shoots the gun so that somebody can, you know, come back, you know, with a 12-point buck, you know, on the top of their car during deer hunting season, that's legal, you know, and it's something, you know, that uh, most people would agree should be uh, legal on that. And, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, getting at a Nicholas Cruz, you know, is something that could be done. And, you know, again, I think that the red flag provision where we put the due process first because that's what we do as Americans rather than putting it second uh, on that, uh, we will be able uh, uh, to get the guns away from people who would misuse them because uh, they have got a mental health issue and hopefully get them into some kind of a treatment so that they can become productive members of society. But how do we know that for sure that they're mentally ill? How do we know that for sure? Well, how can we, how can we know, prove somebody you know, and just you know, the, automatically ban them from buying weapons? Well, the well, hunters use a single shot. Right? Well, well, you know, yeah, you know, you know, you know if, if I can answer your question, you know, you you know, you don't know that for sure. But the way the mental health laws are written now is that in order to prove somebody is a danger to others, they've got to be a danger to others and to have an overt act like shooting up the school on that before, uh, you know, they can get put in there. And it has been against the law for decades for anybody with a mental health adjudication to possess any kind of a firearm. You know, ditto people who have got the uh, criminal convictions on their record. That's been the law for about 80 years now. Uh, so, you know, you have to look at what is causing the problem. The finger on the trigger is what's causing the problem. And if you've got somebody who's not all there up here being the finger on the trigger, you're going to have a tragedy. And we have a tragedy. So, you know, look at what has caused the tragedy. The tragedy was not him using a gun that might be legal for hunting uh, in most states of the Union. The tragedy was the fact that he was bragging about, you know, on social media, the fact that he wanted to become a professional school shooter. Now, you know, he could use a single shot uh, firearm to shoot up a school rather than a semi-automatic. The thing is, is the get to him before he does that. And I've described, you know, a means which I don't think the NRA really likes, but going into court, you know, and whoever the respondent is, you know, who is accused of having some kind of a mental problem, you know, will, you know, be able to tell his story to the judge and the judge will be able to make a determination. And it's just like, you know, if somebody who is involved in uh, uh, a uh, you know, disruptive uh, 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 home situation to go in and get a restraining order, you know, against their spouse or, you know, whoever is living with them, and a restraining order gets put into the NIC system and they can't, uh, for the duration of the restraining order, possess any kind of a firearm. So, you know, don't look at the piece of machinery which is used 
probably in you know million to one uh, uh, chances of uh, of being used for illegal purposes. Get at the one person who is the bad apple in the barrel, and the way to do that, you know, is by getting a an adjudication that he is a danger to others before he actually goes and shoots places up and harms or kills others. Uh, now we're going to people who live in the fifth district outside of Sussex. Jed Wolf of Maple Road in West Bend. What was that? Oh, yeah. You. I heard Maple Road. Sorry. This is Sunspreader. Thank you. I stand with you 100 percent. Thank you. I am. And I am the NRA. I know guns can be used in terrible situations, but it's not the gun. Because if they don't use a gun, they'll use something other. We all know this. Evil is evil. Schools must be hard, and you're going in the right steps, and I applaud you for everything you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do more. Uh, of Nashua Avenue in New Berlin. Let's hit that on. That's me, sir. Go ahead. <clears throat> um, it looks like I don't fit in this category, but uh, I talked to um, Senator, uh, Republican Senator uh, earlier. Um, my, my question was, um, Social Security and Medicare. Um, he, he said he corrected me. I said that we were supposed to receive the $70 increase in Social Security. It all went back into Social Security and Medicare. I did not receive a dime. And it's been the same for the last three years. Um, so, and he corrected me and said that it was an average of $70. But uh, that's so hard that you're expecting something for Social Security and a monthly increase, and they haven't received a, nothing for well, three years now. Well, there, there, there are two different formulas. You know, the COLAs every year on Social Security are based on the consumer price index. The 30% that beneficiaries pay for Medicare B, which is a voluntary program that most Medicare recipients take, you know, is based upon the increase in the cost of Medicare. Uh, doctor, doctor bills part of Medicare. And the inflation uh, for uh, medical care has always been higher than the inflation for, you know, the general consumer price index, which includes a Medicare component. Uh, so, you know, that's the reason why. Uh, with Medicare B, the uh, beneficiary receive, pays 30% um, in premiums and co-pays and the like. Uh, the taxpayers pay the other 70%, so it's a mm -hmm. pretty good deal, and that's why most people will sign up for it. But again, it's two separate formulas. What Congress did is that if you received a relatively low Social Security payment because of how much you and your employer paid in during your working years, uh, and a higher increase in um, uh, Medicare. Uh, there's a hold harmless provision that Congress passed a couple of years ago that said you would not see your check every month reduced. So it stays the same regardless of what your Medicare uh, 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 premium is going to be. So you know that's the answer to the question. Mike Army of uh, Wauwatosa. Yeah, thanks for doing these. So I'm concerned about climate change, and I want to follow up on something I've heard you say in the past about it, um, which was that the solution is technology, um, which I, I basically agree with. I, I think technology is really important, but we also have a lot of technology that's already here. Um, we have wind and solar and hydropower and nuclear or technologies we already have. I was wondering what you see as the role of the federal government, if any, in uh, promoting the uh, uh, further distribution and the deployment of these technologies that already Well, used. the role of the federal government is two things, you know. One is providing money for research and development uh, of technologies that is too risky for the private sector to put their own money up for. And I, that's, that's largely basic research, applied research, 
It's usually commercialization of successful basic research, which I think the private sector ought to end up being paid or end up paying for. You know, the second thing that we have done, and which has continued under the new tax bill, is various types of tax credits for uh, the installation uh, of various types of renewable technologies, you know, both at the corporate level, such as wind farms, but at individual levels, you know, if you want to get heat pumps and things like that, where you would end up, uh, uh, you know, using less fuel in order to heat your home in the winter and cool your home in the summer. Uh, you know, a lot of the rest of the stuff, you know, the market works on it. You know, there have been some renewable technologies that the market will never work on, you know, unless the price of oil reaches about $400 a barrel. And we'll be in such a bad depression if that ever happens that nobody's going to have any money to do anything, you know, on that. So R and D, you know, tax credits, you know, I think are good. Uh, sticking your thumb, you know, on the scale means that we will end up supporting technologies that will never make it in the market. And the final part of this equation, and this is the third leg on the stool, is vigorously enforcing the intellectual property rights of inventors. And the two biggest pirates of intellectual property rights are those that are getting to be the two biggest polluters in the world, China and India. Thank you. Uh, Alan Ringer, Rock Ridge Road in Waukesha. Hello, Senator. Thank you for uh, taking your time out of your day to answer questions here. Um, my question is about uh, the FCC's decision to repeal net neutrality via the removal of Title II protections for internet providers. I was wondering what your thoughts are on that, and I know that law is going to come into effect quite soon, so I was wondering if there's anything in Congress and in the Senate yeah. uh, to try to reintroduce Title II protections on internet providers. You know, the answer to that question is yes. It is not going to be a reenactment of Title II but it will be something, you know, along the lines uh, simply to not leave no regulation in this field. Uh, and the House side, the Energy and Commerce Committee, you know, is working on a bill which I think should come up sometime in the late spring and early summer. Uh, you know, granted, you know, the light of this Congress is, you know, uh, taking away because bills that aren't on the President's desk by it the end of the term on January 3rd have to start over from scratch. Uh, but I think that there is a desire, and hopefully on a bipartisan basis, uh, to be able to, to deal with this issue. The actual details are to be determined, so I can't get into that. But the Energy and Commerce Committee is working on it. Are there any things specifically, in your opinion, that you would be fighting for? Or are you just waiting to I, see? I am the not on that be? committee, so I can okay. fight till I'm blue in the face. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the committees that I'm on, I can influence. But this is not something that is under the jurisdiction of the, the, the Judiciary Committee. Uh, the only thing that is under the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee is antitrust law. And there's plenty of competition on the Internet, so that doesn't come into play. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Uh, John, is it Getsky, Gutsky, of Interlock and Drive and Comwalk? John Getsky. Okay. Thank you. I've gone to several of your uh, talks before to clarify how the government works the different agencies. The question I have, right now we have a situation where I don't see where the Congressional or the Senate, but the executive branch has total control of it. And that's this uh, investigation with the judicial and the FBI. The problem that I see is I don't see a means of investigating. Well, first of all, on the Russia investigation, the House Intelligence Committee, you know, released a report, and there was a minority report from the Democrats, you know, that is available. The House uh, Judiciary Committee and the Senate Judiciary <coughs> Intelligence Committees are still working on that. You know, relative to the FBI, um, we have been awaiting the, or the Inspector General's report, which should be coming within a matter of a couple of weeks. The Inspector General does not have subpoena authority. And 
If you want to clam up to the IG, you can do so, and the IG will so state in his report. Uh, Judiciary Chairman Goodland, and we do have jurisdiction over the Justice Department, including the FBI, uh, said on um, one of the talking head shows uh, over the weekend uh, that once the IG's report has come in, you know, he will ask the committee to authorize subpoenas for the people who refuse to talk uh, to I.G. Horowitz. And I've had a lot of dealings with Michael Horowitz, and he is a straight shooter, I can tell you that. And I will support the issuance of those subpoenas because the committee has to vote on them. Would that also include the judicial end of it? Uh, well, the, you know, the answer to that question is no, because that's a violation of judicial independence. Uh, uh, on that, but I think one of the questions we <coughs> need to have answered, you know, is why patently false applications were made to the Foreign Intelligence Court, which is called the FISA Court, uh, you know, upon which wiretap warrants were issued by the FISA Court. You know, I'm a lawyer, haven't practiced for 50 years, but, you know, I am a lawyer, and one of the things that gets you disbarred very easily is deliberately misleading a court. Uh, and uh, if there was deliberate misleading of any judge, whether it's a FISA judge or somebody else, there ought to be discipline involved in that. And we will get the evidence that can be sent to whichever state has licensed the lawyer that did that. Law licenses are issued uh, uh, on a state-by-state -state basis. The state Supreme Court here is the one that issues the licenses. Uh, William Savatsky, uh, Hillendale Court in Pewaukee. Yeah. Uh, first of all, good luck on the upcoming election. Uh, I voted for you in every election you've ever been in. <laughs> and what I want to know is how can somebody who's been in the Congress for almost 40 years, every decision you've ever, have ever made has been right. I can tell you it hasn't been right. There are votes that... <laughs> Everyone is correct. There are, there are votes that I have regretted upon retrospect, and I'll tell you one of them. You know, the Indian Gaming Law was uh, 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 presented to Congress as a way to curtail Indian gaming, and it was used to do exactly the opposite. Yeah, I, I, I have to agree with you on that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, your, your stance on gun control is right on. It's the best defense against a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun that knows how to use it. How's that working so far for the schools? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Mr. Savatsky has the floor. In the beginning, I said, let people speak uh, and don't interrupt them. Please don't interrupt, interrupt Mr. Them. Savatsky. But that's that's the best defense. And whether it be arming the teachers, which I'm, I don't know about that, but well, I'm not for that. But I uh, I pretty much agree with that. Mm -hmm. But having armed guards that know how to use people that know how to use it, not just giving a janitor a gun or something like that. But I think that's you can't take you can't take the rifles or the guns away from people. That's just that's just not right. And about Trump, I voted for Trump. He's doing exactly what I want to see. And so are all the rest of you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Walter Frost, mm -hmm. uh, Center Oak in Hartland. Thank you, Congressman. Um, you pretty much answered the question, my question about the Second Amendment rights, and I just want to weigh in on that to say that uh, I would be concerned if there were any further erosion of those rights for a lot of law-abiding citizens, and it seems like their position on that is just that. Um, my other concern with that is, is perhaps an end around. Um, to force law-abiding gun owners to, uh, either with uh, uh, heavy insurance rates or taxes on ammo or additional taxes on guns, kind of an end around just to make it more costly. Uh, and, and I would be concerned that that might, might be an issue more so than just taking guns away from people. But I, I do support the Second Amendment and the rights of, of Seriously, an overwhelming number of law-abiding citizens when it comes to that. 
Well, you know, I will just add one thing. And that is about 10 years ago, the Supreme Court in the Heller decision said that the Second Amendment provides an individual, or protects an individual's right to keep or bear arms. You know, there's been, you know, they, there's been a long debate because the Second Amendment starts, you know, a well-regulated militia, dot, 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 and, you know, the right to keep or bear arms will not be infringed, whether that applies to the militia only or applies to everybody in the Heller decision. Uh, the court uh, ended that debate, you know, by saying that uh, uh, Second Amendment is an individual right that has been granted to the American people by the Constitution. I think, you know, there's been a lot of... Please stand up. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's been a, obviously a lot of information in the media, mm -hmm. and so um, it, it, you know, I don't know as, as we get a kind of an impartial sense of where that's going in Congress, um, you know, and I hope that just about everybody would agree with me on that. Um, I, I, is, there a, is there a feeling that you get from the, the other congressmen about about where that may or may not go? I mean, you, you seem to hear different stories every day that says, you know, we're limiting this or... or well, you know, I, again, it depends on who you talk to. You know, again, I can speak only for myself. You know, my record is I want to do something effective. You know, I don't want to come up and say having a gun-free zone within a thousand feet of any school is going to solve the problem on that. It certainly did not solve the problem in Parkland, Florida, but there are many of my colleagues who said, well, we kept guns out of the school because it's a federal felony uh, to possess a gun within a thousand feet of any school building in the United States. And you know, I don't, don't mean to be a cynic, but uh, uh, you know, what I can say is that laws are only as good as the enforcement. And, you know, if, uh, if, if, if it wasn't enforced, and it certainly was not enforced against Nicholas Cruz in Parkland, Florida, uh, because if it was enforced, he could have been nailed when he was 99, 999 feet away from the door to that school rather than getting into it and killing 17 people. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Margaret, is it Wilker or Wilbur Manor Court Slinger? Wilbur, yeah. yeah. First of all, thank you very much for all of the town halls that you hold. I won't be able to attend the one in Slinger next month, so I really mm -hmm. appreciate all the ones you hold throughout the district and give us thank this you. opportunity. My question is, do you think H.R. 1477, which would prohibit the use of federal funds to build a wall along our southern border, will ever make it out of subcommittee and be considered before the whole house? Uh, no. Uh, you know, let, you know let, let me say this, you know, uh, the president said we'll get the Mexicans to pay for it. Well, that obviously, you know, it's not going to happen. However, I introduced a bill in February of last year that basically said that the Justice Department could use about, or would use about 15% of the assets forfeited, forfeited by drug runners, most of which are Mexican, uh, to help build the wall. On that, and uh, the drug trade is worth about 21 billion dollars a year. So even if we were moderately effective of using the asset forfeiture law, uh, we could get the drug runners to end up paying for most of the building of that. Now, a wall is not uniformly effective. A wall only works where it can be patrolled. And of the 2,200 mile southern border of the United States only about 700 miles can be effectively patrolled. You can't have the border patrol running back and forth there. You can either bust through it, jump over it, or dig under it and get into the United <coughs> States. The remaining 1,500 miles is either mountainous or along the Rio Grande. Uh, where it's mountainous, we should use you know, various types of high-tech equipment, uh, such as uh, uh, infrared sensors, motion detectors, drones, and things like that. Because usually people cross, you know, in the mountains and the valleys and maybe a couple, 15 miles inside the United States, the valley reaches the peak and you put the border patrol there and they can pick them up if they know when they're coming. And along the river, uh, what is now being proposed is a levee with fairly steep walls and a three-foot fence on the top of it. And that would be very useful for flood control because the Rio Grande 
is either a trickle or a torrent, very rarely anywhere in between. So having the, <coughs> excuse me, the steep levee, it would be, it'd be very hard for anybody to climb up against it. Now what the Border Patrol says about the wall is even when they admit that it's not going to stop illegal entry in the United States, it will slow it down so they can get to where the illegal entry is being attempted so that they can be able to catch the people who, you know, see where the Border Patrol trucks are going back and forth and they'll be able to get to where the uh, illegal entry is attempted and be able to catch uh, the people who are illegally entering our country uh, 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 because they've got the time to get to where they're trying to illegally enter the country. And, you know, they're the people, you know, who are down there, you know, all the time and, you know, can tell us, you know, what they see firsthand. <coughs> so, um, you know, I think we can pay for at least the physical wall uh, through asset forfeitures, the high-tech stuff, uh, and the levy, you know, I think is, is the better way to do it, uh, where the wall can't be controlled, and the administration is getting to that. What's the status of the bill that you introduced? Well, uh, you, know, th you know, this is, you know, kind of a, you know, a checkmate at the present time. Because you have all of the Democrats wanting to provide some kind of relief for the DACA kids and the Dreamers. Mm -hmm. And you need 60 votes to pass any of this in the Senate. The Republicans have 51 and the Democrats have 49. Uh, and Trump is insistent that if he's doing anything for the Dreamers, that funding for the wall uh, uh, be included uh, in there. And we had a government shutdown at the end of January. Uh, because the Democrats ended up uh, not supporting a temporary extension of funding for the government, and that didn't work out very well for them. So the next time we came up against that, which was about a month ago, uh, the Democrats didn't object to that, and the Dreamers changed all the site of all of their demonstrations in Washington from the Republican National Headquarters to the Democratic National Headquarters on that. And, uh, uh, people who have come up and, you know, said you got to do something for the Dreamers, but you got to oppose the wall, you know, I told them that what the President's uh, conditions are, and he's the one that's got to sign or veto the bill in the end, is that, you know, are you really telling me that your opposition to the wall, uh, uh, Trump's, pun intended, you know, uh, attempting to do something for the Dreamers, and, uh, usually they look very puzzled and walk out of the room at the time. Uh, John Sefar, uh, Valley View in the Nominee Falls. What is S-427 regarding Social Security? That's a Senate bill and I don't know what, what that is. You know? I got a letter trying to fight it and I was wondering what it's all about. I don't know what it's all about. The bill is in the Senate and uh, you know, the thing is, is that Social Security, uh, because it's funded by taxes, is a tax bill, and any senator that wants to propose that ought to read the Constitution, because tax bills have to originate in the House. Which means they have to have an HR number on it rather than an S number on it. I think this was a press release type bill. Now we get <coughs> to people who uh, don't live in the 5th District, and Mark Wolf of Erlane Court in the water. Yeah, um, I just want to say, uh, you're probably wondering, what the hell am I doing here? Um, I used to live in, actually I, I was born and raised in Falls. Mm -hmm. So, but that was a long time ago, but you've been in a long time, so I'm not exactly sure. Anyways, about 38 years ago, I had to make a choice of how I was going to make something of my life and uh, uh, explain that to my maker. And so I became a reading teacher and I taught children how to read in Milwaukee. So I had to move into Milwaukee because yeah, some I people thought they, they had the right to tell me where to live. So uh, anyways, has that been repealed by the legislature? Yes, it was. But we've lived in Milwaukee for 30 years and uh, we haven't gotten uh, uh, to the point where we can move. Uh, anyways, but uh, you know, this, this um, uh, guns in the schools is a real issue because uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, detoured children around mortally stabbed uh, adults so the children don't see it. I don't know how many of you had to t 
tell your class to get under their desk because uh, bullets were flying. Um, I also had to redo my bulletin board because there was a bullet embedded in the uh, bulletin board and I didn't want any of the children to see that. So this business of the guns in the schools, yeah, they're there, handguns. And when you, I've gone to school board meetings and oh, they act surprised. Oh no, you're not surprised. Who's bringing the guns in the schools, the students? Yes. Okay. Um, and I tell you what, Um, those nice little signs, those nicely printed signs that says uh, no guns allowed in the schools, mm -hmm. that means, it simply means that I'm totally defenseless in that school when somebody does come in and surprise, surprise, how did the war on drugs work out? That isn't working too good. How did prohibition work out? That didn't work so good. So these little signs that say don't bring guns in, they ain't working so good. Um, I'll try to make this as short as I can. Um, time after time, the previously trained government and criminal justice bureaucracies have failed us. Um, we do have background check laws, but some whole states have not even participated in those. That is not acceptable. And maybe the federal government can say, look states, you know, if you want, uh, uh, these background checks are only as good as the database, and if your whole state is not contributing to it, you have you have well, uh, you know, left a giant the, hole. You know, all uh, apparently there is twelve states that me, all of them are contributing, uh, you know, to it. And when I passed uh, the Nix law in uh, uh, in 1993, you know, there was money in it to have the states be able to computerize their criminal justice you know, and mental health records. And that was expensive and that took a while. For example, West Virginia, not one of the most up-to-date places in the country. You know, they had all of their records on three by five cards in every county courthouse in that state. They're now, you know, all into the NICS system. And a federal firearms licensee has to use the NICS system in order, uh, you know, to legally sell a firearm. Well, that's how it's been reported in the news. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, well, I was the author of the bill, and I'm proud of that bill because 4.7 million illegal sales have been stopped since it became fully up and operational. Now, you know, what goes on in Milwaukee County? You know, I, you know, I agree that the criminal justice system, whether it's the DA's office, you know, or the criminal court judges in Milwaukee County, you know, are not doing their job. And, uh, you know, way back when, uh, I uh, was quoted as saying Milwaukee <coughs> County is, or Milwaukee is becoming the murder capital of the country. Mm -hmm. All hell broke loose when yep. that. Yep. You know, the Marquette basketball coach, you know, went down to the Journal and the Greater Milwaukee uh, Committee condemning me for that because he was afraid that parents weren't going to send his basketball recruits uh, to Marquette by reading that. Well, what happens? You know, a month after all of that, there was a staff person in my office who went to Marquette uh, University and lived at 22nd and Kilburn who got mugged on his way to class. So, you know, I waited until I found out if he was okay. You know, he went into the health office and he didn't have a concussion. You know, I lost a little bit of blood on that. So I called up Father Wilde, who was the president of the university. Uh, and I reported this because he was one of those that was yelling at me, you know, about the lack of law and order in Milwaukee. Well, uh, Monday morning, uh, right after he opened up, my cell phone goes off and there's Father Wilde, you know, saying, well, our counseling department dealt with him. The counseling department was his roommate, you know, who dealt with him. So when he came home with a big bump and a bandage on his Yet, you know, he got his counseling. It wasn't anything that the university reached out for. And then to add frosting on the cake, on Wednesday he was in my office asking for a quarter of a million dollar grant to put cameras up in the neighborhood of Marquette. I said, I think that's a university responsibility because it's your responsibility, first, not mine, to provide for the safety and protection of the kids that go to school there. No firearms involved in this. Hmm. I, I even had some of the weapons in my own hands, and when I handed them to the administration, uh, time after time, 
I, I, I've asked, well, who's going to be calling the police? Are you calling the police, or am I whipping out my cell phone? And uh, time after time, oh, we don't want the school to look banned. So we're not going to, we're well, not going to. Having gonna, bullets in the bulletin board, I think, is pretty bad. <laughs> uh, so it's, you know, so it's, it's been a, uh, it's been a, a long-term uh, problem, and it's an uphill uh, problem. Well, next um, time you see anybody who's running for judge, and we're having some elections uh, know, for judge, judge, you ask them about that, because every one of the talk shows that I listen to, there are uniform complaints about the DA's office. Uh, not charging people who ought to be charged. Judge is putting people on probation that shouldn't be put on probation. You know, uh, my feeling is if you commit a crime while armed with a firearm, you do some time. Well, RDA likes to go after people who say things that they don't like and have midnight raids at their at their home. I don't know if you're how familiar you are with that. Oh, I am. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Um, so as you can probably tell, uh, I've rubbed elbows and uh, gotten in the faces of a lot of administrators, and it hasn't always been pretty. So I've got, I've, I've, I've scraped by and made it to retirement. Okay. Um, my and advice. Go back to the falls. Well, well. Okay. <laughs> my, my last thing. My last thing is uh, when I got into trouble, uh, I was, I was told, be strong. So everything that you've done, I appreciate it. And my advice to you is, all, actually all three of you, be strong. Thank you. That's Last important. up before we get to the second part of the meeting is I think it's Susan Wilson of Dutchess Court in Appleton. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm from Appleton, but I actually grew up in Milwaukee, so mm -hmm. that probably qualifies me. You were, you were a smart one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we, are, we know that AR-15s and AK-47s are killing machines, and even if the state of Wisconsin allows AR-15s in hunting, I, I, that's not sport. It shoots six shots per minute, I mean per second. You know, how is that sport? But besides that... Well, the DNR says so with their fish and game regulations. And I'm addressing that at our state representatives, our state officials. Okay. And an AR-47 is fully automatic, and that's illegal. So when we were kids, when we were kids, we did not fear going to school and being shot to death. And even back 20 years ago, a scribble on a bathroom wall that said, watch out for Friday the 16th, probably meant someone had a hot date. Now it means they close a school and they call the SWAT team What's changed? What Society, has changed? Brothers. Society. Kids. They're I think it's I think it's the strength of the NRA. That's what's changed. There are, there are a lot of parents that have not fulfilled their responsibility as parents. And you know, I you know, uh, where you learn your values is at home. And you know, uh, secondarily if you, your family are people of faith, you learn it at church. You know, legislative bodies, you know, cannot deal with that issue. We have, you know, First Amendment prohibitions on bringing religion in the schools, you know, on that. That's got to be done at home. And you can't expect the schools, even legally, to be able to make up for the failures of parents at home. But the point is, now, if you think that you can go out and pinpoint everybody that's got a mental health problem and stop them before they grab an AR, an AK-47 or an AR-15. AK-47s, ma'am, are illegal. Fully automatic weapons have been illegal for decades. There's but a they're getting them. That's my point. No, they're not. All right, AR-15s. AR-15s. AR-15s, I'm sorry. And you know, you have one bad oh, apple God, and millions yeah. of people who use a semi-automatic weapon for hunting. You can have a semi-automatic pistol, you know, which operates just as quickly and just as deadly. It just doesn't look like, uh, you know, a quote, assault rifle, uh, unquote. And you know, I'm not here to say that I'm going to penalize the millions of people who use 
uh, an AR-15 legally because DNRs in practically every state in the Union have said that is a legal and sporting weapon uh, uh, for hunting because there are a couple bad apples in the barrel. Why are there bad apples? There are bad apples for all of the reasons that I've stated in response to the many questions that have been asked tonight relative to firearms, you know, on that. And again, I'm here to tell you that, you know, we did have a semi-automatic weapons ban, you know, for 10 years that uh, Clinton signed. It didn't stop uh, semi-automatic weapons from being used for illegal purposes. And doing it again isn't going to stop semi-automatic weapons from being used for illegal purposes. And Congress is not going to pass an effective law that says that everybody who has a semi-automatic weapon ought to turn them in. That isn't going to happen. You know, these people are going to say to hell with that. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of people that will do that. So let's look at doing something that will be effective. And I think I've outlined a whole lot of things that will be effective. And I hope we're able to get the support in Congress and with the President to get them passed. Okay, that concludes the number of people who signed up to speak. Just at 8.20. Thank you for coming. If anybody's got a personal problem that applies to them alone uh, with either state or federal